Hello again, this is Bruce Wallenberg. This is Lecture 12B, which is Part 2 of our Optimal Power Flow Lectures. Now we're going to set up now the solution of the ACOPF. Uh, believe me, this was the most difficult uh, uh, problem to solve. And as I said, it, it, I, it took 30 years of, of researchers, uh, people who worked on a solution and it turned out that their solutions weren't very good or didn't converge rapidly enough and so on and so forth. People might dispute that. <laughs> you could probably get different opinions from others, but it took a long, long time to get uh, reliable solutions, not until the 1990s. Okay, so we said that um, first we're going to have the uh, same objective again, the minimum of the, uh, the sum of the operating costs here. And then we have our AC power equations, one equation for real power and one for reactive power for every bus. So there's, there's two equations per bus, except for the reference bus. You don't put those uh, equations in for the reference bus. And the reference bus voltage and phase angle are considered constants. The voltage magnitude at the reference bus and the phase angle are considered constants. Um, we add the generation inequality constraints for on P and Q into the problem. Now, we're, now we're, we're dealing with reactive power, so I can I can put the Q constraints right into the problem as well. Now I can in, put transmission constraints and I can I can restrict either MVA flow, par, M, megawatt flow or MVA flow. Uh, sometimes it's it's useful to um, put MVA flow in. If I wanted to I could put current flow, uh, ampere flow limits if I wanted to, but usually um, we do either megawatt or MVA flow limits on transmission lines or transformers. Um, it's it's uh, it's a it's a useful thing, especially for transformers. Transformers are often rated in M MVA, um, and transmission lines. It's often done in megawatts because that's what uh, we're really looking at or restricting on the system. Uh, voltage constraints for every bus, if you wish, we can have a min and max voltage constraint. Now. Solution of the ACOPF. Um, constraint equations are nonlinear. So we must iterate to a solution like we do in a power flow. There really are two methods that, um, uh, uh, there, there are variations on, on these methods, but the two methods that uh, I'll comment on here, the one is called the iterative LP method. We're going to explain that in some detail. The other one is called the interior point method. They are both used actively uh, by, the, by the power industry, by, by uh, uh, the computer systems that operate the markets and so forth can, can use either one of these methods. And they will get to the same solution. They will get to the same solution. Um, and the the interior point method really will take another another whole lecture and, and we're, it, it's not included yet in, in these two lectures but it's in the appendix uh, we talk about that uh, that that method interior point but we're going to talk about the iterative LP method um, so to do this um, iterative LP we're going to change the problem and say the problem really is to use increments around a solution. So so instead of being pgen, it's delta pgen, delta qgen, delta v, and so forth, delta theta. We assume that the delta are perturbations around some solved case, and, and, and that solved case keeps getting updated during the process. We, we start with a solved case, we do an LP around it with these delta variables and it moves them in, an, in the optimal direction and obeys all the constraints. Then we get a new solution. And then we do a new solution and we do new perturbations around that. I'm going to show you a little drawing here in a little while that, that uh, outlines that. 
So the objective function is to minimize, first of all, we have p gen 0 plus the derivatives times delta p gen. Now this is, this is a constant, and anytime you have a constant in an optimization problem, you can forget it. It doesn't, doesn't play a part. So we're just trying to minimize this function right here, this over all the generators. Okay, and the, the, the derivative, the incremental cost, uh, marginal cost, if you will, is evaluated at the, the uh, nominal solution. Here's the power flow equations. Guess what? The, the power flow equations, when you, when you take the derivatives, this should be familiar. This is our, our, our friend, the Jacobian matrix that we use. In the, it's the same equation that we use in the, the, uh, the Newton power flow. And so one of the things that we do in the, the LP method is that we solve it, and then we go back and solve, we solve the power flow. Well, then you just use the Jacobian, just transfer the Jacobian values into the LP, because we're going to use this is now considered a set of linear equations. Okay, this is a set of linear equations. We're not going to invert this. We're just going to just going to use this. These are these are variables. These are variables. This is a set of linear equations that we use inside the LP. Um, the delta p gen. If you have uh, the the uh, initial solution, and this this should this should have the little zero on it here. Same thing with the Q's over here. So I can limit the, uh, the excursion or the delta depending on the min and max. I, could, I can make those inequality constraints. Same thing. Uh, this should be zero here for the, the V. I can do it for the voltage constraints. Now here's, this, here's what happens in the iterative LP. I want to, before I get, before I get into this, I want to, I want to talk to you about something that's very important. Uh, learn this about optimization. Um, it's, it's much harder to get your, your problem to always meet the inequality constraints than it is to follow uh, direction along the, the optimal path, or the, the gradient, if you will. And um, it, it turns out that uh, methods that do a, a good job of meeting inequality constraints, well, the LP is really one of the best, if not the best, for doing inequality constraints. Um, you, you basically make the problem into a series of small LPs where you've linearized everything. And you, you don't, you make it a small LP. I, I call it a window. I use this term window here. So let's say here's here's my solution. I'm I'm sitting here at this red dot, and so I say, okay, I've got x1 and x2, and I want to get to here's here's three constraints. There's one. There's two. And there's actually four constraints. Pardon me. And I want to get to the to the optimum over here. Let's suppose I'm trying to to drive it, and and it, it keeps going down if I move in this direction. Or whatever. And in, in this case, I want to move toward that set of constraints. What I do is I linearize it. So you notice that I've got, I've got the, the, the objective and it's linearized around the, the, that dot. And then I, I did this window. Now the window says that x1 and x2 can only get to be so big. I can only move them up and down by so much. It would do me no good to say, I'm going to start here and the x1 and x2, it, it would do me no good if the, if the I'll, I'll just show this, with the, to have a window that went out like this. Because once I get further out from this point, the linearization is, is of no value anymore. The linearization dies because the, the objective function is nonlinear. But within a small region, by linearizing the objective, I can, I can move to this. So I move to this optimal point. There's my first solution. So the LP operates inside of this. Then it, we, we relinearize. We change the, the objective function and all of the constraint functions 
are relinearized and I build another window that's like this. Now there are methods to adjust the window size depending on a lot of other things. We're not going to go into that here but, but just suffice it to say that uh, we keep moving the optimum and we get the next the next solution would be to come over here if if I get to this point let's say right here and I want to draw my my window like this well you'll notice that I already I have a constraint that I'm hitting over so now my LP will obey that that linear constraint over there um, and move to uh, to this point down here see so it the window just because it comes up to a constraint the the constraint cuts the window off and cuts the window down a little bit but it's a small window so you move in small steps and the LP does the perfect job of keeping everything within limit and then you just relinearize move relinearize move relinearize and the final solution will be uh, very very close and you can you can shut the window down if you if you want you can you know when we get near the near the solution we can we could make the windows smaller like this we get down to the to the end we can make it even smaller well eventually there's no movement at all in the variables and um, you get to a to a final solution so this is this is the process of, of iterative LP there is an AC optimal power flow using iterative LP in the uh, the programs that are available uh, to use with uh, with the textbook uh, on the uh, the site at the University of Minnesota okay so we solve here's the step solve a base case linearize the objective function linearize the constraints set variable limits that's my little window here solve the LP if there's a significant change go back so now we we just go back although we have a new base case and we the base case comes from the the the, the optimum that the LP reached and we just keep going around the loop like that going around the loop until we're done until we're done here's an example AC OPF on uh, on my six bus system here's the uh, here's some of the results um, you notice here that uh, we when we solve um, the these are the the generation values here is the lambda p, um, which is the which is the locational marginal price, the lambda p for every bus in the system. Now you notice that it's not they're not equal. These are not equal. 12.5, 12.44, and so forth, all the way up to 13 and down to 12. The reason these are not equal to that to the value that we that we would get if we solve the uh, optimal with uh, with the uh, linear or DC model is because there's losses. There they are, megavar losses and real power losses are listed up here. Um, we have limited uh, uh, line flows in the in the solution as well and so that's also accounting for for these differences in the lambdas. Um, and so we've we've limited the two to four line to 60 megawatts. Well, it pulls it to 59.98, and it pulls three to six to 59.97. And there's a Lagrange multiplier associated with each of these, with each of these uh, voltages in the system. The um, the first two buses, they are generator buses, both go to the maximum. Uh, voltage they push up to the maximum that gets me some some more minimization whereas the other three uh, are still just uh, below the the max here but but the voltages go up too um, now I, I want to go back now and talk about locational marginal price at at the buses there's a there's a very simple formula and later on I'm going to use the formula and see how it compares to the value that I got from my AC uh, OPF result 
the locational marginal price is the marginal increase in total generation cost to supply one additional megawatt at bus K. Okay? It's the definition, it's the, it's the, the basic definition of a Lagrange multiplier. Okay, of a Lagrange multiplier, but we call it the locational marginal price. Once again, this is very important in the markets, the operating markets, and we have a we have a whole lecture series uh, uh, in in this series from the University of Minnesota uh, that was done by a, a friend of a friend of mine, Ross Baldick, uh, University of Texas. The whole series on and markets would not have been possible without the development of OPF. The OPF uh, literally had to come first, so to speak. So if we take and we say I'm gonna I'm gonna put one extra megawatt in at this reference generator and I'm gonna pull one extra megawatt, pardon me, I'm gonna pull a an extra megawatt. So here's one megawatt out here. I misspoke and I'm gonna put enough power in here to supply that extra megawatt plus the extra losses. Well, it turns out that since this is this is a this is taking it out of the network, the equation says that the P ref is equal to this delta PK and this 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 is where this this uh, negative sign comes out and it's minus DP loss DPK. That's the so-called incremental loss. The incremental loss says, well, what's the what's the change in the loss on the network because I'm pulling one more megawatt through the network from the reference bus to this bus. What's the change in loss? What's the derivative of losses over here? And that's a that's a very basic uh, equation. And we say, well, that the change in total cost is basically now the the, the C is the, the cost function at the reference bus times its d derivative with respect to the reference bus power times 1 minus the incremental loss times this delta uh, PK. Well, it, it turns out uh, that this is the LMP at the, the bus. So let's, let's go back now and say LMP is the change in operating cost on the system to supply one megawatt at bus K, and that's this. We just we just worked that out. I essentially I took the, the the delta delta P from from over here and dropped it underneath this this delta T cost, and so we we can say the following that the LMP at bus K is the LMP at the reference bus minus the the incremental losses times that same LMP at the reference bus. So when there's no transmission losses, the LMP at K is the basic LMP at the reference bus plus this loss component. Now if you're dealing with the DC power flow, the linear power flow, then this this one goes to zero. But for an AC we have this loss component. So there's a, they, they like to say there's a system cost component then there's a loss component uh, for, for the bus. Now it gets much more complicated now and we don't go through all the equations in, in this set of uh, um, slides here but here, here's the diagram where we said okay now uh, I'm going to I'm going to take this one megawatt here at bus K, just like I did before, and I'm going to supply that one megawatt plus the change in losses on this bus. But at the same time, the same time, I've got a line flow that's at limit. I solve the L, the uh, the optimal power flow, and this one is at. That's very important. At its limit. It's at the limit. Now, if at, if it's at the limit and I move power from here to here and there are some losses, I'm apt to go over the limit or I'm apt to move it lower 
below the limit. I don't want that. When I say it's at the limit, then this flow has got to stay constant. And the only way I can do this transfer from the reference bus to this load bus K is I got to have another bus J and that bus as this adjusts the 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 J bus will adjust up and down just to keep this equal uh, this flow constant. So we're going to go back to our basic Lagrangian. This is the sum of the reference bus plus the, the CJ of PJ. I'm minimizing that. I have a, a lambda times the P load plus B loss P minus P ref minus PJ. So that's the the uh, the, the the sum of of all the the uh, buses in here. And then I have the flow is equal to its flow limit, and I have the Lagrange multiplier for the line flow. Well, it turns out that the flow on line L is equal to its initial value plus the delta. And we have to define something in here, which is called the A factor. And really what that is, is it's the change in flow. It's delta. F. Let's see if I've got, do I have that on the, I have this, no I don't. Um, it's the change in flow on line L for a change in power on bus J. This is, this is L here. And we call that the A factor. It's another very quick derivation that comes out of the uh, linear power flow. And uh, we, you can look that one up in the book. But this is, the, this is the, the line flow sensitivity. So if that flow, the, the change on this flow then is I make a change on bus J, I make a change on bus K, and that gives me this delta flow. Or I can say the flow is the base value plus this plus this. And of course, this is the initial value and this is the current value. The line flow sensitivity says, how much will line L change if I put one megawatt injected or one megawatt taken out from the, from the load bus? This, this minus sign comes in because K is a load bus. Well, then it turns out, I, I am skipping pages of, uh, of mathematical manipulation, but it turns out now, now the LMP, uh, let's, let's skip over here, it, it has the reference bus LMP, the incremental loss times the same LMP of the reference bus minus, remember the Lagrange multiplier on the line flow constraint times this line flow sensitivity. If you have, uh, uh, if, if you look at these then they, they, they will say, okay, here's LMP. There's the system marginal price, that's this guy right here. There's a loss component, that's this component here, DP loss times the, the LMP ref, minus this sum over all the lines that are at limit with their respective Lagrange multiplier and line flow sensitivity. So there's three components. Again, three components. The system reference, the loss component, and the line limit component. Now I took the AC power flow that I had before and I did a case with no line limits. So here's the, the locational prices uh, calculated using the formula that we had. And here it is, now you, you remember that if there's no line limits, um, uh, this was uh, uh, that, that, that you're going to get, this is, the, this is the lambda at the reference bus, here's the incremental loss, so here's the value of the, uh, of the LMPs. And then I did it uh, from the, the optimal power flow, and they compare very well. They compare very, very well. Um, there's uh, uh, it, it, by the way, 
in in here I could have put LMP as being this. I could have just put this number right right here, and 12.05 compares exactly with what the the OPF got, and the OPF matches it at least to a couple decimal place accuracy here. Um, then I did it with line flow limits uh, down here on two to four and three to six. So you need you need the the reference bus lambda the the incremental losses you need this mu or the the uh, the, the, the the Grange multiplier we need these these a coefficients that uh, I had the pro these are the the a coefficients for those two lines in any event I use this this formula LMP minus incremental loss times LMP plus mu times a and I compared it to the value that I got from the OPF, okay? And the match is, 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 is pretty good. At least I think it's pretty good. It's, it's within a couple places here, okay? Um, and so that's just to, to, to introduce that to you, that uh, when, the, when the OPF solves, you get this. You get this thing here. And uh, those are very useful. Those are the basis of the way we operate the power system. Security constrained OPF. Now, how do we do an OPF where we're going to worry about security constraints, security limits? What we do is we create contingency constraints so that the resulting OPF will not have any overloads if any line outages occurs. So what we're going to say is, I'm going to solve the OPF, and I'm going to put these constraints in. And when I get a solution, if I then run a contingency analysis on the final solution, none of those contingencies will produce overloads. In fact, if the OPF is doing its job, each contingency uh, that's been placed into it will result in flow on the monitored line that comes just up to, but not over, the limit. So we're going to use what we call the, the compensated um, LODF factors. That's in the, the chapter uh, appendix on the security analysis chapter. And so then we, we the, 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 this is another, another thing here is that you have to iterate this solution. You solve it with no contingency constraints. So you solve the OPF and you ignore outages. Then you take the solution and you run a complete contingency analysis. Any outages that cause overloads, we remember what those outages were and we add constraints for them. Um, you, the, it, it's not a bad policy to say take the worst one, put that one in, and then solve it again. Don't put all of them in. Um, and the reason we do that is that, it, that the, the, the number of contingency constraints, remember, would be, would be a product that's that's uh, how, how many contingencies are there? There's n times n minus one over two. That's that's how many. So it it goes up like n squared. So if you have a thousand lines, there's a million. Well, five hundred thousand. But that's still a huge number. We can't put that many constraints into the uh, to the OPF. So we solve it once, run the contingency analysis, and it comes back and says, okay, I got five constraints, and we say, put the worst one in, then solve it again. Now put the worst one in, and by by doing that iteration, you'll you'll come you'll get to a, a security constrained solution. Here, this I apologize. This is very hard to read, but I wanted you to see this. Well, this says solve a base case optimal power flow, and we do the contingency screaming screening algorithm, and we take the m worst contingencies, and we solve AC power flow one to all the way across on the, the worst M, and we save the contingencies over here. Save the contingency constraints. Now you can put them all in, or you could just put the worst one in, and you solve the optimal power flow again. When you're done with, with that, you go back, and you solve all the uh, optimal power flow again until the OPF has converged. 
When the OPF has converged, you have a new operating state, you go back, you do the screening again, you get the M worst cases, and you go around. So there's two loops that are going on here. Um, here's the basic with, if I just did the DC, I can do the DC OPF uh, with these security constraints. And by the way, this is what a lot of the markets operate. A lot of the markets do not use an AC uh, OPF for the security constraint part. They use the DC model. Not surprising, because it's it's it, it's easier to cope with. Well, we start out. We have our basic p-gen variables, theta variables, uh, and we start out. And this is the basic uh, model with no line limits. This will solve uh, with uh, with with just those variables. Then I'm going to add the line flows. And I, I the initially what I do is I add all the line flow. Uh, in here now, this 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 model above here uh, had b sub x in it. Okay, I should. So it had b sub x, but this one says, okay, I'm going to limit the flow on each of the lines. I can at least put that in so that I don't result in a dispatch from the OPF that has line flows that are out of limit. So okay, all the flows are within limit. So now I've got the basic transmission flows. Uh, into the uh, to the problem, and then last of all, I add the contingency constraints. Now, I would have taken the first solution and gone through a contingency analysis, and maybe add, and, and added the worst one in. And then the next one, I keep I keep accumulating these constraints. And you know, this is the the flow in. It comes up comes from up here plus my my friend. I call it the d factor times the flow n again and this is uh, this is the uh, this is really the d factor is the LODF the line outage distribution factor so I'm monitoring line n and I've got an outage on on line M so these are actually security constraints here's an example I took my my six bus system here it is in its, its original form. I added three transmission lines. There's one, there's one, and there's one. And I duplicated it, only I numbered them uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So it's now 12 buses. And I said, there's area 1 and area 2. There's the boundary between the areas. And we're going to do a security constrained OPF. So I said the result. Uh, of the OPF without and with contingency constraints. So with with no contingency constraints on the problem, if you drop line 7 to 10, let's go back uh, 7 to 10. That's this line right here. If you drop that line, uh, you get an overload on 8 to 10. So we go back, and where is 8 to 10? That's... that's uh, that's this line here. I get an overload on this line. So this line starts overloading. Uh, the, the flow ends up at 93, where the limit should be 75. I do the same thing. If I drop 3 to 6, I get an overload on 2 6. That's back on the other side of the system. The, the flow is 75, just a little bit of overload. Now I put the contingency constraints in. When I drop uh, 7 to 10 down here, it comes out with the contingency flow of 75, like it should. And the two, the dropping the 3, 6 comes out with a limit of 75. Now, again, this is with the DC OPF. So normally my lambdas on the buses, the LMPs, will not be different. But here they're all different, and that's due to the line limits. That's due to the line limits. So I've solved a case with contingencies protected or, or taken into account. Thank you very much.